uh, in 2004 and 2005. And uh, I'd gone back to seminary, so I was just a little older than the other fellows, most of them. So I was younger than some, older than some. But uh, I had been in ministry a few years, and a lot of the young guys in seminary were writing about Calvinism. They were talking about the doctrine of Calvinism, and they were you know, writing about the problems with the doctrine of Calvinism in and, and, and like several classes. I, and so I phoned home. <laughs> I called Pastor McClure, and I said, Dr. McClure, I said, why, what is the deal with Calvinism right now? Is there a resurgence in it? And, and uh, he said, well, you know, come to think of it. And uh, he just mentioned, you know, if you, if you take the majority speakers on the radio, people that are preaching on the radio, so, and I'm talking conservative stations, we have a, uh, the music on our local radio station, the conservative one's pretty conservative, but the preaching is not. Uh, the, uh, and I'm talking about uh, BBN. And uh, you would take, depends on the week, sometimes they'll have a week of this preacher, and sometimes they'll have a real good preacher that isn't, into the doctrine of Calvinism. But generally speaking, their evangelical preachers are Calvinists, generally speaking. And when they talk about grace, and when the Bible talks about grace, they're not talking about the same thing. I learned when I was a child that grace is God's riches at Christ's expense. You ever heard that acronym used? God's riches at Christ's expense. On a test in high school, I had to fill out a definition for grace, and it was two words, unmerited favor, undeserved favor. In other words, grace is getting something that you do not deserve. I remember in high school, I preached uh, I preached in preaching contests and things like that, and I preached a sermon once on faith, and I preached a sermon once on grace, and when I studied, I looked up the simple definition for grace. Grace was not uh, God sovereignly chooses people to go to heaven and people to go to hell before they were ever born. But today, that's grace. Today, when you talk about it's true, isn't it, Charlie? Today, when you hear somebody talking about the doctrines of grace, what they mean is God hates people before they're ever born, condemns them to hell, and it's okay because He's good because He's God. And that's the doctrines of grace. So you ought to know Galatians. Because Galatians talks all about grace. Talks all about justification. And uh, that, uh, as simple as it seems, sometimes you're talking to somebody and you're not talking about the same thing. And grace is one of those words. Um, another word, and, and I'm just using, I'm just giving you a couple more for example. Another word that you may use and somebody else may use and you think you're having a conversation with the same premise, and you're not, is the word worship. I may be talking about worship, and I'm talking about one thing, and someone else is talking about entirely another. It's true, isn't it? Um, to me, worship, there's a lot to it. I, I like reading Tozer on worship. I think he gets all the aspects of worship and kind of does a good job explaining the difference between uh, simply having an emotion, simply having a feeling, and worshiping God. But one of the words that Tozer incorporates in his definitions for worship is admiration. But he puts it this way. He says you can admire something and not worship it, but he said you cannot worship something and not admire it. Another word that he uses often is reverence. Reverence. He says you can't worship that which you do not revere. There is a sense of exalted loftiness to the object of worship. Um, so sometimes when I'm talking about worship, I'm talking to somebody that says, Jesus, you rock. That doesn't seem reverent to me. It's kind of like, high five, Jesus. And that's a little shocking to hear Pastor Price say something like that, isn't it? Why? Because it seems irreverent, doesn't it? But that's what that person means by worship. And what I mean by worship is I understand I'm so consumed by the concept of God's holiness that when I come into His presence, I fall. Instead of me being lifted up and being uh, open and being um, unashamed, I bow. So when somebody calls me and they say, we'd like to talk to your worship leader, 
and I say, you got it, I'm the worship leader in our church. I, I lead the worship. Um, oh, you do? Well, what instrument do you play? Tell, well, I usually just sing, but I, I, I can pound on the piano a little bit. Um, and, uh, oh, really? Well, what, uh, you know, what about your worship team? I said, well, the whole congregation is the worship team. We all worship together. We team up for We have corporate worship. In other words, all of us. And uh, then pretty soon they realize I'm just talking about the service. I'm not talking about the performance. And so we're not talking about the same thing. Justification, grace, mercy. These are words that when you study them, if you do not define them in the basis of a scriptural context, they will be defined in the basis of a cultural trend. They'll be defined in the basis of whatever author has spun his definition in whatever latest book it is that he's written or that is being read and that's being sold by Zondervan or Baker. And I'm not just upset or frustrated by this. I'm just telling you as a church, if you don't know what a word means in the Bible, you don't know what a doctrine is. It's important to know Bible doctrine. One of the things that is common to have happened today by people who frustrate the grace of God is to redefine words in a different context than they are in the Scripture. And one of the things that happens oftentimes is that we find, and as we're going to see this evening, we find the law and grace placed in a situation of opposition, juxtaposed, where literally they are made so that they are different, that they are not connected in any way. And Galatians dispels that. So let's read our text, make a few comments this evening. And if ever I could recommend Scripture memory, I would recommend some of the verses that we're going to read this evening. You'll see those in a few minutes because we're going to park there. Verse 15, and if, you'll, if you can, try to bring yourself back from last week and remember this conversation that the Apostle Paul had as he is, uh, as he is articulating his right to be an Apostle on the basis of his call from God, and lastly, by the recognition of the other Apostles, one of the issues that he brings to the forefront uh, that he mentions is this trouble at Antioch where there has been uh, this separation between the Jews and the Gentiles. And it is the Judaizers getting, um, getting Peter and James, James separating from the Gentiles and uh, really making the Gentiles feel as though they're lesser Christians because they're not living under the law. And Peter has gone off this way. Paul has brought out to Peter this argument that says, if you were saved by grace, same as the Gentiles, and if you, uh, being a Jew, livest after the manner of the Gentiles, not as the Jews, why compellest thou the Gentiles to live as, we, as do the Jews? So Paul's argument is, Peter, if you were saved the way the Gentiles were, if you were uh, living like a Gentile, now why are you trying to get the Gentiles to become Jews? See, that's ethnic, that's national, but that is not doctrinal. It has to do with their background, and it has to do with uh, the requirements for a, a particular group of people, but it does not have to do with a, with a biblical requirement. And Paul's part argument here, he's doing two things in the letter, and by the way, we're going to read our text in a minute. I realize it's taking a long time introducing this. Paul's argument here, though, has two purposes. First of all, he's letting everyone know that he is a legitimate apostle and therefore has the right to, to speak what God has showed him, what God has shared with him. He is, he is arguing, I have the right to pen this letter to the church at Galatia correcting false doctrine. I'm a legitimate apostle. God says so and the other apostles recognize it. And one of the best ways to recognize the legitimacy of an apostle is to be corrected by one when you are an apostle yourself. See, what was the highest authority man 
or speaking in man's terms in the first century church. It was the highest authority. An apostle wasn't. It wasn't a pope. It wasn't one. Uh, there was a group of men that had been eyewitnesses of the resurrection and had been called by God to be apostles. You had to be an eyewitness of the resurrection and you had to be selected by God to be an apostle. That was a pretty high calling. And there were only a few of those. I don't know what the exact numbers are. <laughs> you could argue all you wanted about it. Um, but there were the 12 minus Judas. Then there was Matthias added in. And then there was Paul. So 13 or 14 apostles. Doesn't matter. They were all, all those ones were selected by God with the authority of an apostle. And Judas, of course, never exercised any authority because he hanged himself before the church really got its start. Now, having said all that, um, the second purpose Paul is trying to accomplish is he is using this conversation with Peter to introduce a doctrinal error right? by the faith of Christ and not by the works of the law. For by the works of the law shall no flesh be justified. But if while we seek to be justified by Christ, we ourselves also are found sinners, is therefore Christ the minister of sin? God forbid! For if I build again the things which I destroyed, I make myself a transgressor. For I through the law am dead to the law, that I might live unto God. I am crucified with Christ, nevertheless I live. Yet not I, but Christ liveth in me. And the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by the faith of the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. I do not frustrate the grace of God. For if righteousness come by the law, then Christ is dead in vain. Father, help us this evening to finalize in our hearts and our minds this matter of the law and the matter of your graciousness toward us. We thank you for what you'll do. We pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. Knowing that a man is not justified by the works of the law. Paul begins with a premise or an assumption that it is common sense that no person has ever been justified by the works of the law. Now, what's the word justified mean? Well, it's the same word as righteous, but it's a verb form. So righteous means without sin, right? Everybody knows that? Righteous means no sin, means uh, not guilty, uh, not guilty of any sin. And justification is the process of an individual being righteous. I know it's not a word, but if you don't know what the word justification or justified means, justified and righteous is the same concept. Literally, justification is the idea of you being made something which you are not made by something else. In other words, no person ever was made sinless through the law. It is an exact opposite purpose uh, that the law performs. The law does not make a person righteous. The law exposes sin. The law shows that a person is not righteous. A person could have not sinned, and the law would do nothing to him. It would have no harm, but it also would have no good effect. The law didn't make a person sinless. It simply diagnosed or simply said this is sin. In other words, the law said, Thou shalt not lie, or thou shalt not bear false witness. So a person who said something about someone else that was not so broke the law. But if a person did not break the law, he wasn't justified by it. You see what I'm saying? In other words, the law never had the purpose of justification. It didn't do anything to you. It simply identified you if you did something wrong. I'm getting blank stares. Let me see if I can illustrate this. Uh, I need some paint. I wish I had some paint right now. Um, this <laughs> is all I have handy. This is a glob of uh, 
tar. We've been playing with some tar lately over at the church building. I've got some boots that can't ride in my vehicle right now because they've got tar on them. Okay, now um, this is tar and it is right here and it's not supposed to be touched. Okay, it's just sitting here and if we have children here and we tell them don't touch the tar, uh, it's right here. Okay, you understand this? So this is, let's put it up here where everybody can see it. Here's tar. Don't touch it. Okay. Now, um, it's a trap. Okay, this is a tar trap. Sort of like the tar baby, you know, with the brer rabbit and so forth. It's a tar trap. Okay, now, I'm just going to put it this way. I'm going to say, don't go near the front of the pulpit. Don't walk within three and a half inches of the front of the pulpit. Don't do it. Okay? Now, here is, I don't know, let's pick on adults this evening because children do it, they're told a lot better than adults don't. It's true, actually. Uh, children have more consequence. You can tell an adult to do or not to do something and they'll be like, well, you're not my boss. I'll do it anyway if they want to. But you tell a kid not to do it, usually a kid won't do it. Normally. Uh, unless curiosity killed the kid or something like that. But children usually are more obedient, in my experience, than adults are. Okay, so I say, folks, don't go near the pulpit. Okay? Don't go near the pulpit, and kids don't go near the pulpit. So here's Brother Chris. He comes in, and he's got to clean on Saturday evening. And he's, got to, he's got to clean the church auditorium. So he comes in, and he remembers, Pastor said, don't go near the pulpit. And he thinks, that's for the kids. Right? Pastor doesn't want the kids in the pulpit. Uh, but, you know, it's not for me. And he goes by, and he goes... Uh, he said, don't go within three and a half inches. What will happen to me if I go within three and a half inches? And I got him. I marked him with the tar. I, I put a tar trap on the pulpit. Okay? So I come in and I say, Hast thou <laughs> steppest within three inches of the pulpit? And Chris says, Uh, yeah, no. <laughs> <laughs> And so he tells a lie, right? Okay, so he's got tar on him, okay? Now, Kathleen comes, and she's still a little afraid of pastor. Okay, so she comes in, and she's like, you know, I'm not supposed to go within three and a half inches of the pulpit. If I see Kathleen, I don't know anything at all about her, except that she didn't touch the tar. She didn't go near the pulpit, right? That's all I know. I don't know anything else about her. In other words, it doesn't necessarily make her anything else. Not touching it doesn't do anything to you. Touching it gets tar on you. And that's like the law. In other words, the law doesn't do anything to you unless you break it. But if you break it, it'll get you it'll say broken. It identifies and it shows you what you've done and it shows everybody else for that matter, particularly God. God gave the law. You're not to break it. If you break it it'll leave a stain on you. It'll get your conscience, won't it? <laughs> that conscience is something you can uh, you, hey, you can kill it, but it's hard. And it'll get after you and it'll pester you and it'll bother you and convict you. <coughs> Justification is being made righteous. Now, if you've got tar on you, I can put an anti-tar. <laughs> no such thing. I can just put something over here. If you've got tar on you and you come by here, well, no, this is, okay, this is still the tar. This works. This is what I wanted to get to. Okay, this is the tar trap, right? So now Chris is dirty. He's got tar on him. He's already been identified. He's already guilty. But he's, he's ruined his new white shirt. He's got tar on it. And he says, you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to go buy the tar trap and not touch it. I'm clean! A tar trap only has the ability to dirty, not to clean. You get this? You can go buy it twice. I can set a tar trap in another place and say, don't go near the piano or Mrs. Price will get you with her tar trap. And you can go by and say, didn't touch it. And look at your tar trap that you touched over there and you're still dirty. You see, the law condemns and that's all it does. The law identifies that you have sinned 
it says that you are now under its jurisdiction. You now have its consequences, but it does not justify. Now you say, Pastor, you've overemphasized that. You can't overemphasize it enough. It is impossible to overemphasize the fact that justification does not happen by the law. And that's exactly what Paul is telling Peter. Paul says, Peter, if you want to come under the law, I just want to remind you that the law never did anything to clean you. The law never saved you. The law never delivered you. The law only condemned you. And if you want to come back under the law when you have been made free from the law, I just want to remind you that the law can't do anything for you. There's no benefit to it. That is the same argument that is made by the author of Hebrews to the believers who are Jewish, who are undergoing so much hardship and persecution that they have decided, you know what, it's better just not to be a Christian because it's just too hard to be a Christian. So I'm going to go back into Judaism. And I'm going to pretend to be a Jew, even though I'm really uh, not. I'm going to try to go under uh, a law that a man made, and I'll see what it can happen. And they're urged not to do it because the law can only condemn. And friend, there's no profit in condemnation. You get this? Now, notice that the Scripture never says the law is, is void. Matter of fact, if you read what Jesus said about the law in Matthew, He said, I came not to... I came not to destroy. destroy the law, but to fulfill it. In other words, he said, I'm the fulfilling, I'm the only person that can keep the law. And my friend, when Jesus kept the law, it did nothing for anyone. It just proved that he never broke it. He's the only person who was never sullied by it. He's the only person who was never condemned by it. But Jesus Christ keeping the law didn't save anybody. Do you realize that? The fulfilling of the law by Jesus Christ only showed that he's the only person who's ever done it. No man has ever fulfilled the law. That's what the scripture says here. By the works of the law shall no flesh be justified. Now we have to define justification. We, we have to. We said it's righteous. But justification is something that happens to you, not something that you do. Justification is something that happens to you, not something you do. And by the way, my friend, justification only happens in one instance. Only one person can justify in any situation. And that has to be an innocent person. It has to be the one who has fulfilled the law is Jesus Christ. Only Jesus is qualified to justify. Did you know that? When you talk about justification, you're talking of a concept that has no application outside of salvation. There's no lost person who's ever been justified in any sense of the word. Justification is being made righteous. Righteousness is directly connected with the holy nature of God. Only God is righteous. Only God is holy. Everything man does that tries to mimic or imitate righteousness, the Bible calls filthy rags. So if you are justified or made righteous by any person but God the Son who fulfilled the law, all you could be is covered with their sin. Only Jesus can justify. Justification is only possible by God. So it's an important term. It's a Christian term. It's a word that believers use exclusively. Uh, and it's a word that we use uh, having to do with the perfect nature of Jesus Christ and His ability to cleanse sin. Friend, only the blood of Jesus one of my favorite statements, one of the things I, I always want to say, I want to get it put on my pickup. I want to put just two words on, on my tailgate or on my back window. Only Jesus. Only Jesus. I love the song, Only Jesus can satisfy the soul and He can cleanse the heart and make me whole. He'll give you peace you never knew, love and joy, heaven too. But only Jesus can satisfy. Wonderful words. Only Jesus can justify, my friend. So when we talk about justification... We are not talking about a person keeping the law. We are not also talking about a person rejecting the law. We're simply talking about the fact that a person is under the law and has been justified. The concept of justification and the concept of grace, which describes the process of justification or the fact that we've received justification or been justified, only that... I'm sorry, I've lost half my thought, I, and it's important. I've got to go back. 
<laughs> okay, he's talking about the jurisdiction of the law. That has nothing to do with, with, with the jurisdiction of the law. In other words, many times you ever heard somebody say, we're not under the law, we're under grace. Well, friend, that isn't actually true. We're not justified by the law, but we're under it. Do you get this? You show me where the Bible says we're not under the law. We're not justified by the law, but we're under it. And this is a doctrinal error many Christians have today. Many Christians today say, well, it's free grace. Um, once saved, always saved. Is that true? Sure, it's true. But when you're saved, the law is abolished. The law no longer has effect. The law no longer condemns. The law no longer whatever. No, friend, you're justified. In other words, you're cleansed of your sin, but it isn't as though you were never sullied by it. Do you get this? By the works of the law, there shall no flesh be justified. In other words, the law can't justify, but the law can condemn. And when Jesus Christ satisfied the work of the cross on Calvary, He did not abolish the law, He simply erased its effect. So sin still condemns. It's still identified and condemned by the law. Sin still sin. But there are believers who honestly really believe to, and, and by the way, they pick and choose how far you can go with this. They pick and choose the sins that are under liberty, the sins that are under grace, quote-unquote, and uh, they <laughs> pick basically the ones they don't commit. And, yet, and then they justify things that they do by saying, well, you know what, I'm not under the law, I'm under grace. Friend, that's not true, you're under the law. If the Bible says, thou shalt not, thou still shalt not. And if thou dost, then you're sullied by it. The law says you're guilty. The Bible says thou shalt not bear false witness, and you can be saved all you want to and lie all you like, and it'll still be a violation of God's law. You get this? But if you're saved, it won't, you won't go to hell. Why? Because you're not justified by the law. You're justified by grace. God's riches at Christ's expense are the work of the cross of Calvary. Did I muddy that? I hope not. We made it plain. Now the Bible says this, but if, now this is a hypothetical situation, and this is one that has a possibility. In other words, if you do this, then this will be the result. There are a lot of, a lot of if clauses in the Scripture, and there are four possible outcomes. One possible outcome of an if and then, um, which we call that a protasis and an apotasis. Protasis is if this is, and then the apotasis is the second part of the statement, then this is also true. Well, here is a, uh, for the sake of argument, if this is true, then this will also be true argument here. Let's look at it. Verse 17. But if, while we seek to be justified by Christ, okay, now is that is that an accurate endeavor? In other words, is it possible to seek to be justified by Christ and succeed at it? Hello, come on. Yes, yes. Can we seek to be justified by Christ and do so? Yes, okay. But if we seek to be justified by Christ, if while we seek to be justified by Christ, we ourselves also are found sinners, is therefore Christ the minister of sin? God forbid. Now here are the Jews saying to the people who are justified by Jesus Christ, obey the law. And here we're talking about ceremonial law. Here we're talking about ritual law. And the, the ceremonial law, or the ritual law, if you will, didn't ever even have to do with sin. It, it just had to do with really a heart's attitude of obedience. And it was a national Israel thing. It was not required of the Gentiles. It was a Jewish thing. It was a thing that only Jews were required to do. So if we try to do that, and we're if we're justified by Christ, and then on top of that we try to keep the law, if we fail at it, is it God's fault? That's the idea. Is Christ therefore a minister of sin? Do you know a Calvinist would say yes? They would. God ordained sin. Uh, a Calvinist, you know a Calvinist believes that God wanted Adam to disobey him in the garden. You say, Pastor, they wouldn't put it that way. They wouldn't put it that way, but they'll finally admit it if you talk to them long enough about it. 
Yes, it was God's will that man would fall. Because from the foundation of the world, He had a plan for redemption. Well, friend, that's just a reflection of God's mercy. It's a reflection of God's foreknowledge, but it does not mean God wanted sin. A couple of years ago, our men, we went on a men's uh, prayer retreat, and we had a Calvinistic preacher that showed up to preach. I didn't know he was Calvinist. I know he preached that way. I don't think a lot of people there did. But he preached that God ordained sin. That God wants evil. God uses evil. My friend, it isn't so. And Galatians chapter 2 and verse 17 makes the argument that it isn't so. Because... If that were so, then Christ is the minister of sin. In other words, this idea here is, while we seek to be justified, if we also try to stay under the law, who's to blame if we falter, or if we default, or if we fail? Jesus says, see, it's not both. It's, it's one or the other. Either you're saved by grace or you're saved by the law. You can't be saved by both. And that's the argument here. So, friend, how are we saved? The law condemns. Is the law saved ever? No, the law cannot save. It has never saved. The law can only destroy. So he goes on to say, For if I build again, is the is a continuum of the argument, for if I build again the things which I destroyed, I make myself a transgressor. Well, it's self explanatory. For I through the law am dead to the law that I might live unto God. Now he explains how this is possible. I am crucified with Christ. The idea with Christ is a baptism word. It's a baptism word. Literally, as Christ is crucified, so am I. My identification is that when God looks at me, when God justifies me, one of the things that He does is He says, He died. Ryan Price, you are guilty of sin. When you receive Jesus as your Savior, you died. I died. I did. Because, yeah, go ahead. I died. When I died, I died when I identified with the death of Jesus Christ on the cross. Because He died in my place, see? So if I'm going to accept the substitution, did Jesus die for His sins or for mine? Which? If He died for my sins, I'm dead. Get this? He died in my place, but it was my, it was my death. He died for me. He did it for me, but it was done for me, and therefore it's my death. So it says, I am crucified with Christ, and then there's a caveat, nevertheless, or in spite of this, I live, but I'm still alive. And he goes on to talk about the flesh. He's not just talking about the Spirit. He says, yet not I, but Christ liveth in me. If Jesus died in me, then He lives I'm sorry, if, if, if Jesus died in my place, so if my death was in His, then my life, His life is in me. See this? My death in Him, His life in me. That's amazing. Not a good deal for anyone but me. He got my sin, I got His righteousness. That's justification. Christ living in me. So Paul is pointing out, I'm crucified with Christ, nevertheless, in spite of this, I live, he says, but understand this, yet not I, but Christ liveth in me. In other words, the life that is in me is not in this flesh that will die. The life that is in me is in Christ that lives. My life is Jesus in me. No person has life without Jesus Christ. Only through Christ do I live. And so if I'm going to live through the law or I'm going to justify myself, if you will, or think I can justify myself through the law, I'm trying to do it in a way that cannot be done. Only Jesus. Get this? Only Jesus. Life is only through Jesus. Death is through us. Life is through Him. His death through me. My life through Him. And He's living in me. And then he goes on to say, The life which I now live in the flesh... I live by the faith of the Son of God. So here's the reality of it, though. Where do we live? Where do we live? Fort Lauderdale. <laughs> Come on, help me. We live in a body. Uh, I don't remember if it was last week or the week before I went to Brother Mark Brown's funeral. His body was there. But he wasn't there. 
His body was there. He wasn't there. And it was interesting because I think, as far as I know, everyone at the funeral was a Christian. Everyone there, I think, were believers. Uh, and uh, so no one really made anything out of his body. Now, I've been to funerals where people are lost. They're not saved. And it, it, it kind of um, makes me uncomfortable what the way that they treat the body. Because they treat it like, the, like it's the person. They go up to the casket, and, I, and, and I don't know, if, if you've talked to the body of a lost, I mean, of a relative that you've lost or death, I'm not criticizing or condemning or saying it about it. But they go to the casket and they hold a conversation with the person like they're, they're not there. Not there. That's their body. That's where they live. That's where we remember. When we see the person, we see the body that they live in, but that's not them. That's just the container that held them. That's why a Christian oughtn't to make too much out of the physical body. They don't marry a body that's going to die. <laughs> marry a soul. Marry a person that's in the body because that's what's important. And so um, the Bible says here, the life which I now live in, uh, in the flesh, I live by the faith of the Son of God who loveth me and gave himself for me. So now he, Paul says, he says, I have to live by faith. He says, I, can't, I have to live by faith in the Son of God living in me. In other words, I just have to believe that God's in me. Why? Well, because this body is a body of sin. And it still has sinful tendencies and propensities. I want to tell you something, Christian. I want to be as practical as I possibly can. You need to understand this and, and just, just uh, mark it down and, and, and believe it because it's true. If you taught your body to sin before you were saved, it still knows how after you're saved. I've heard people say, Pastor, when I got saved, I was a drunkard. I was a smoker. I did thus and so. And when I got saved, I put down my cigarettes and never wanted one again. Well, you may have seen your cigarettes appropriately. You may have seen them as damaging the temple of the Holy Ghost. You may have seen them as harmful to others and harmful to your relationship with God. You may have seen your drinking for what it is. You may have seen it as a waste, as destructive to the body, as harmful to those that you love. And you may have gotten a, a genuine hatred for those habits. But your flesh still wanted to drink. And, and I don't believe you and nobody else does either if you tell me you no longer wanted to drink. I'm just telling you something. You, you, you still could salivate and, and uh, get that taste of alcohol. I've never tasted it. I've heard it tastes terrible and you have to develop it taste for it, but I've developed taste for things people think are terrible, so I know it's possible. I can't understand wanting to smoke. I, I, never, I never have, but a lot of people were taught to smoke and learn to like it. I'm not going to bring up pipes at this time and talk about how I like the smell of a pipe because I don't want somebody to get distracted by it. But the truth is that your body wants to sin. And if you're saved and you try to play the game of, well, I don't feel like doing wrong or feel like doing sin. Anything you've ever taught your body to do, it still wants to do. And you have to live by the faith of the Son of God. In other words, the reason I'm going to do right is because Jesus lives in me. This is practicing the omnipresence of the indwelling Jesus Christ. And I'm not talking about practicing in the sense that, well, I'm going to let Jesus be alive in me today. No, I'm talking about Jesus is there and I'm going to believe it. See, Jesus... Hey, have you ever sinned after you were saved? Was Jesus with you when you sinned? He was. You just acted as though He wasn't. And that's exactly what the Scripture is talking about here. It says, I'm going to be aware. I'm going to live by faith of Christ in me. In other words, I'm going to believe that Jesus is in me. If I'm aware that Jesus is living in me and speaking in me and talking to me and working in my life, then my behavior, my flesh, is going to be exercised accordingly. So Paul said, if a person ever obeys the law, it would be because Jesus is living through me. In other words, your obedience through the law is simply a faith in Christ. It's letting Jesus and the work of the cross live in you. The victory that I have is through Jesus Christ. You, you see what that means? In other words, the death that He has is through me. The cross is... Me living in Jesus. 
And the life that I have is Jesus living in me. And that's why no Christian can ever be prideful about anything they've done. Because somebody says, well, you know what? It's amazing. I tried so hard to stop that, and I never could, but you just stopped just like that. Well, no, you didn't. <laughs> Jesus just never did it. And you went ahead and let Him have His way in your flesh. See, Jesus, Jesus doesn't tell lies. So let Him have His way in your, in your flesh. And you won't tell lies, but it'll be Jesus living in you. Jesus never, and you can name any sin there is. And friend, if you don't do it, it'll be because you believe Jesus. You let Jesus live in you. Do you understand here the necessity then of a believer exercising faith in the Son of God? I'm not talking about for salvation. I'm talking about for victory. Jesus, is this what you want to do with my body? My life is only through you. The only reason I'm not going to die and go to hell is because you died in my place and I'm living in your place. Jesus, what would you have in my life? It's not hard, is it? Not hard to figure out, is it? Jesus, should I say that? You're living in me. You have to say so. Then I'm going to believe you and I'm going to say what you want me to say. I'm not going to say what I know you don't want me to say. I'm going to exercise faith. You know, Christian, that you can be just, you're justified by Jesus Christ, but you have victory through faith. In Jesus Christ. Do you understand that? Real simple concept, but it's a key to spiritual victory. Spiritual victory is simply allowing Jesus to live and allowing yourself to die with Him. You die through Jesus. Jesus lives in you. You die in Jesus. Jesus lives in you. Let's practice it this week. Father, help us to practice justification this week. We thank you for the liberty to do so. We thank you that, Father, though the law condemns sin, that because of Jesus Christ, we are justified. Help us to live it, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen.